Welcome to Get Credit Where Credit is Due, Transfer of Child Tax Credits Between Parents, co-sponsored by the ABA section of Family Law. Presenting on our program today, we have Miles Mason and Cindy McCauley. Miles is a, is a member attorney with Miles Mason Family Law Group, PLC in Memphis, Ten Tennessee, and Cindy is a director with Dixon Hughes Goodman, LLP in Memphis, Mem Memphis Ten Tennessee as well. Miles, you may proceed with the program. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, to the most exciting CLE you will ever experience on taxes and family law. I know everybody has cupcakes and streamers ready to go to talk about tax law in 2019 due to the recent tax changes. So we're going to do everything we can to keep this discussion as exciting as humanly possible. Now, let's assume it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon while attending a long and difficult mediation. Your client's got three kids. You're working up a parenting plan. You're discussing the details, and some of the big issues have just been resolved. And your client looks at you and says, can I get the child dependency exemption? And you realize it is now your position in life to explain to your client, A, the child dependency exemption no longer exists. B, the parenting plan form that you work with has not been updated. C, there are certain requirements to claim the child tax credit, and yes, they are transferable, but there's also a thing called the dependent care credit, which is not transferable. And then there's also uh, head of household filing status which has certain requirements to it. And you're gonna learn about this today. We're also gonna give you tools, tips, and traps to try to not fall into it in terms of how do you take advantage and advise your client regarding these tax issues without getting yourself in a big bag of trouble. Now. One of the very controversial things that I've been involved with in my 25-year career is a lawyer I know who's written a book published by the ABA, but not by the ABA family law section, it has always spoken in public that your contract for legal services should disclaim your tax advice. In other words, saying, I'm not a tax attorney, I don't play one on TV, you agree to get tax advice from somebody else. Now, the corresponding counter-argument is that in legal malpractice actions and or board complaints, professional negligence cannot be waived, which means the question is, on a state-by-state -state basis, can you be held liable for giving bad advice about taxes? Now, the obvious one is for, the obvious solution is to not give tax advice and refer somebody to their CPA or tax advisor. However, in our scenario, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of a mediation, and now you're having to go through the ins and outs of the new child tax credit opportunities, and possibly um, advise your client about whether or not he or she can qualify for the child tax credit. Now, that all being said, what Cindy's going to do today is walk you through all of these issues. She's going to explain 
to you what you may want to take with you in terms of forms, files, whatever, hard copies to take with you to these mediations in the event you get into these issues. Now, what's really, really cool about all this is that many of these publications are available online, so when you're at the mediation, you can pull them up off the IRS website because the information uh, has already been written up for us by the IRS in terms that I think we can rely on. I mean, it's not the Internal Revenue Code by any stretch of the imagination, but it's written for uh, a person of average intelligence, which I'm hoping includes most family lawyers, when it comes to taxes. Now, a couple of tips for the lawyers out there that do not feel comfortable with tax law, which I'm assuming is the vast majority of the attendees today. Really pay attention to defined terms. Okay, especially when we're talking about an IRS publication. One of the things Cindy's going to talk to you about is some IRS publications, and that's where the IRS tries to cover a topic in layman terms and not internal revenue code terms, not in revenue ruling terms. But in general, find a way to, to let the public know what the basic rules are and how they're going to be applied. Now, there are always questions. There are always sub-issues. There are always... Uh, subtleties involved, but when it comes to these issues, they're not, in general, they're not going to be that hard. Um, when I say not that hard, what I mean is you have to read it. You're going to have to read it three, four times. It's not something that comes intuitive. And pay attention to the defined terms, which are going to be capitalized in the IRS publication. And don't be afraid to circle back. And uh, also, as you plan for the 3 o'clock afternoon problem, you may want to pre-plan to have a conversation with your client's tax advisor well in advance. Now, it's also what Cindy does is she's also a forensic accountant and advises divorce lawyers and their clients as part of her engagements to include litigation support. Now, in my recent second edition of the Forensic Accounting Desk book, Cindy was kind enough to draft a sample report that now appears as Appendix E in that book geared towards this exact situation. Namely, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We're at a mediation. We've got a chance to negotiate terms regarding child support and the child tax credit favorable to our clients. Okay, and what do we do? So that letter is already in, um, like I said, appendix E of the book. If you haven't bought it, uh, I think the book is spectacular, but of course I wrote it. How's that for a uh, subtle plug? Um, okay, maybe not terribly subtle, but hopefully gentle plug for the book. But my point is, we're all going to struggle with this because I'm a certified public accountant and I still struggle with the requirements. So I have to work very hard to make sure I know the details and have access to the information so I can double check what needs to happen. And there are several pitfalls that we have to watch out. There are traps in there. And Cindy's going to go over that in great detail with you and hopefully highlight what's most important for you to understand and give you the reference to the material that you need to double check as you make decisions and give your client advice at three o'clock in the afternoon when you finally get to discussing child support and these tax credits. Cindy has been doing uh, forensic accounting, accounting for many, many years. We won't say how many because uh, she's, close enough to hit me. And uh, Cindy has, does a great job for her clients. I've had a great joy to work with her on my cases. Uh, she's spoken at uh, many, many conferences and seminars. And uh, I know she um, has written an article on this topic that's been published uh, regionally and is just an, a great resource. So as you listen, 
feel free to uh, send us some questions. And as we get through those questions, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to make it as practical as we can, but just know that there's no way to know everything that you need to know off the top of your head. And that's what makes it so difficult is you're going to need to have those resources at your fingertips because no matter how smart you are, you're not going to be able to memorize all of this. All right. Take it over, Cindy. Good afternoon. Um, I think I'll start with our first slide that says our objectives of the day, which Miles really kind of summed up a lot of them. But um, our, the first objective is to make sure that we explain the effects of the expansion of the child tax credit, and we're going to include in that discussion the dependent care credit. We also are going to discuss the subtleties of the new tax laws and how the attorneys can use them regarding negotiations, drafting settlement agreements, and as Miles discussed, in mediation. We are going to discuss how the child tax credits can be used by the non-custodial parent, and we'll define later on what that really means according to the IRS, and the dollar value of the head of household filing status. And then lastly, how to best advise your clients on the implications of the new tax laws. So our first slide I thought we'd kind of start at the beginning is what is the TCJA? You're going to see that, um, you know, all over publications and that uh, sort of thing. And I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that that was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It was effective January 1 of 2018, so for your 18 uh, tax returns. And as, as you all know, uh, you have till October 15th of 2019 to file your 2018 return. So there may be situations that you all are running into this, like in mediation today, as somebody that hasn't filed their return yet for 2018, these address these issues are going to need to be addressed. So it's pretty, I mean, I think as far as accounting goes, this is one of the issues that I think pretty exciting because it gives um, definite benefits in the, for those having children. And this slide talks about the changes. So in 2017, you, you received a $1,000 child tax credit per child. In 2018, you received a $2,000 per qualifying child, which we will talk about, you know, what makes a uh, child qualifying in a little bit. Uh, the child must have just, which most children do, but this says this in the rules, um, that you must have a social security number for that child by the due date of filing your return. So if you don't, you know, if, if you have a newborn or something like that, you need to make sure you get a social security number for them. There's also a refundable credit, which is increased uh, with the new tax changes, which may give you a refund even if you do not owe any tax. And it used to be in 2017, the refundable credit was $1,000, and so that has increased by $400 to $1,400 in 2018. And as far as the, so you don't get the full $2,000 per child, but you could get the $1,400. And um, there is a lot of different eligibility requirements, which we'll go through for different aspects of this, but those have not, the eligibility requirements have not changed. Okay, so the AGI phase out changes. AGI is your adjusted gross income. And so the income limitations have increased significantly from 2017 to 2018, which kind of, to me, is, again, another exciting thing because more people, more people are going to be eligible to take the credit, and it's a bigger credit. So that's helping, you know, all, all the families. So in 2017, 
somebody that was filing single or HOH is the head of household or qualified QW is qualified widow, in 2017, if they made $75,000, they would start phasing out and not be able to receive the child tax credit. In 2018, those same filers, are the limitation starts at 200000 So that's going to give us a lot more people that are eligible to take this credit. Married filing jointly in 2017, somebody that had $110,000 was starting to phase out where in 2018 it's 400,000 which is a huge increase and then the married filing separately in 2017 was $55,000 and in 2018 that has increased to 200,000 so basically it's 200,000 for anybody filing a married filing joint return and it's $200,000 for all other So the credit is reduced, those phase out limits on the prior slide, once you hit those limits, the credit is reduced $50 for every $1,000 of your adjusted gross income or a fraction thereof above that threshold amount. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you an example of how that's calculated. No lawyers just love math, so let's do the math. So we have an example here of a single taxpayer with one child and income of adjusted gross income of $210,000. So the math, we start with the AGI of $210,000 and we're going to deduct $200,000, which on the previous slide was the start of the phase out. And so that gives us we are $10,000 above that. And so $10,000 divided by your 1,000, which I mentioned on the slide before, is 10. So your, your credit is reduced $50 times 10, and so it's reduced by $500. So instead of getting a $2,000 deduction for that child, this person is going to get a $1,500 because you're going to, because that $2,000 is going to be reduced by $500. So you still get a benefit, but you know it's, it's just reduced. And the other exciting thing about this discussion is that this these credits are a dollar for dollar reduction of your tax versus a reduction of your taxable income, which you know the exemptions that Miles talked about at the beginning, which are no longer available was a reduction of your taxable income and the credit is a it's a dollar for dollar reduction of your tax which is a better than the reduction of the taxable income all right here is an example and so this is a single person and they are their gross income is $115,000 a year and they're going to claim the standard deduction, which this year is for a single person is $12,000. So you would deduct that from the gross income to come to a taxable income number of 103,000. So we have calculated the tax on that for a single tax person in 2018. And that would be $19,010 total federal tax that would be due. And if this person has one child, they would get a reduction for $2,000, and so their net federal tax due was $17,010. Um, so I know $2,000 doesn't, I guess, sound like a ton of money, but it's just something that needs to be addressed when you're working on these mediations and settlement agreements because if you don't address it then then they're going to have to you know argue about it and two thousand dollars is you know that's just with one child if you have more than that 
you know, it's two thousand dollars per child, so they're going to want to argue about it later. So the best thing would be to try to address it ahead of time. Okay, so this is just a the personal exemptions. So in the past, in 2017 and prior to that, you would get $40,050 personal exemption, and that would be for you, your spouse, and whatever dependents that you have, where in 2018, those are no longer available. So because the exemptions are not available, then they have increased the standard deduction, which I guess is, um, you know, how the IRS is getting around um, or trying to make it better for removing the exemption. So if you look at this chart, this shows you kind of where the standard deductions were in 2017 versus where they are in 2018. So a single or married filing separate person in 2017 could claim $6,500 as the standard deduction. And in 2018, that number has almost doubled to $12,000 a year, which is a big difference. In the head of household, the HOH, in 2017, the standard deduction was $9,350. And in 2018, that the standard deduction for someone claiming the head of household is $18,000, which again is almost double. And then lastly, you have the married filing jointly, which in 2017, the standard deduction was 13,000 and in 2018 is $24,000. So one thing I want that's really not on these slides, but I wanted to mention because I, it's a question that I get asked uh, quite frequently, and this has not changed in the tax law, but two different issues. One is if you are married filing separately, both of you need to itemize or both of you need to claim the standard deduction. So it might not be as much of an issue going forward since the standard deductions have increased, but that was definitely something that um, it needs to be addressed so that one person, if one person itemizes and claims all of the house and the um, real estate taxes, and then the other person doesn't have you know, anything to deduct. And so the, the other issue I wanted to mention was um, I have a lot of people that call me on like April 15th and say, I don't know if I should file married filing jointly or married filing separately. Will you tell us what to do? Well, I can't, you know, that's a hard call to make. Um, but what I will tell you is if you file a married filing separate return, you can always go back and amend and file a married filing jointly. But if you file a married filing joint return and find out that one of the parties was not truthful in preparing their tax return for some reason, then you cannot go and amend to marry filing separately. So, you know, I always, if I'm called on the 11th hour, I'm, you know, I'm going to recommend that you do marry filing separately and you can always go back and amend to marry uh, filing jointly. Which this, this and the way I always remember that is because it's really to me opposite of what the IRS usually. I know this is being recorded, so I probably should not say that. <laughs> but you know, this is one way that it could put less money in the IRS pocket because normally the it's going to cause the tax liability liability to decrease when you file married filing jointly versus marrying filing separately. But to me, it's the best protection out there. I know people uh, have in their agreements that, that 
you know, you are, I'm not sure, Miles, you can probably, what's the language that attorneys put in the agreement, a lot that holds a whole harmless um, clause. But in the IRS's mind, that really, if you file a married filing joint return, that does not release you from liability. Right. And I remember attending an ABA family law section seminar on the innocent spouse relief changes that were issued 10, 12, 15 years ago. And we, as a group, we walked through what can be done. Uh, I would definitely recommend every family lawyer spend a little bit of time talking with their CPAs about innocent spouse relief and the opportunities and tips and traps going through it. The biggest problem is, of course, as a creditor of both parties and the IRS not being a party to the divorce, there's only certain limited protections you can get through the divorce process, but one you may want to consider is getting certain admissions from the uh, potential bad actor that the, uh, assuming you represent the spouse that is less property than not uh, likely to have generated income with uh, uh, questionable tax returns, there are certain admissions you could try to extract out of the other spouse that could be beneficial for the innocent spouse relief application should it be needed to be made in the future about any particular tax returns. Some of those admissions could include but are not limited to uh, that the represented spouse did not prepare or uh, have actual knowledge of any of the books and records related to the tra tax return preparation. And that's just a simple one as well as had no uh, role in management if there is a business associated there with. Correct. Um, but that still doesn't, I mean, I've tried several different, uh, the innocent spouse is just something that's very difficult to get approved, I guess. Um, just my history with it. I mean, I have had it on a few clients, but um, there's a lot more that it was not permitted. And I think the IRS, you know, they don't really care if you file a joint return. They're going to come after whoever they think they can get money from. And I guess that whole hold harmless clause would allow you to go back to the family court mm -hmm. and, you know, get reimbursed. But I'm, I just, I think that's a confusion sometimes on what, what the IRS is versus what your agreement says. Anyway, that was just a sidebar that I get asked that question a good bit, so I thought it was a good thing to say. Um, so they, I guess statistics say that in the old law, the old tax law, that approximately 30% of taxpayers itemized, where they are estimating that in the new tax law, that less than 10% of the taxpayers will itemize. So hopefully that will be easier returns and easier ways to project income going forward. I guess we'll really probably be able to see those kind of statistics after everyone's completed the 2018 returns. So next year probably they'll put more statistics out on that. All right, so this slide is just to give you an example of the benefits of someone with um, showing you how the new tax law is different from the old tax law regarding the child tax credit in the new tax law and the new standard deductions versus what the standard deductions were in the past and the tax rates and that kind of thing. So this is a, um, we're gonna say this is a mom, she's head of household with two children and she made $100,000 a year. So in 2017, she was allowed $44,050 of an exemption per person. So she got one for herself and she got 
$4,050 for each of her children. And so that was a total of $12,150 of exemptions, which in 2018 do not exist. Then you're going to subtract out the standard deduction which for head of household in 2017 was $9,350, and in 2018 was $18,000. So you have that same $100,000 in 2017 would give you taxable income of $78,500. And in 2018, you're going to have more taxable income. You're going to have $82,000. However, when you apply the tax rates to that, in 2017, the tax, the federal tax due on the 78,500 is 13,878, and the tax due on 82,000 dollars in 18 is 12,588. So the taxable income is more. But because of the changes of the tax rates, the tax is actually $1,290 less than 2017. So that's a good thing. Then you also, she's going to get $2,000 per child for the child tax credit. So she's going to get a total of $4,000 reducing her federal tax due down to $8,588, which she owed, she didn't, she was not eligible in 2017 because she was over the limit. The limit was, I think we just said 75,000 in 2017. So because uh, the limits increased, then she gets to take that child tax credit. So in total, in 2017, she would have owed 13,878. In 2018, she owes $8,588. And so that's a total difference of $5,290. So for somebody at this income um, level, the tax rates are a good thing. I'm not saying that they are, it's a case by case basis, so I'm not saying that they are good for everybody, but, um, at least this level of income it was it was a it was definitely a benefit okay so as we've discussed there are no more exemptions that four thousand and fifty dollars per dependent or per person has gone away but it is still necessary to determine which parent is eligible to claim the children Okay, so this is a um, list for the eligibility for the child tax credit, which towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to give y'all uh, at least, I think, four different publications that you can use. And, and a lot of these eligibility requirements are going to be listed in there, or I guess you have these materials also. So this is just a bullet point on who is eligible for the child tax credit. So the parent has to be under the income limitations that we discussed before. So it was $400,000 for married filing jointly and $200,000 for everybody else. The child must be claimed as a dependent on your return. The child must be under age 17 at the end of the year. So this example was 2018. So if you have a child that his birthday is December 1st of 2018, you cannot um, claim them for the child tax credit because they're, they're, they're age 17. They have to be under age 17. The child did not provide over half of his or her own support. The child must have lived with you for at least half of the year. The child cannot file a joint return, which I would think doesn't happen very often, but um, and then the child was a U.S. citizen, and the other item that I had mentioned earlier is they have to have a Social Security number. So. Okay, so this is the eligibility for the head of household filing status. They have to be unmarried on the last day of the year or separated previous six months of the year. 
The child needs to be claimed as a dependent on your return. You have paid more than half of the cost of keeping up the home for the year. And the child mainly lived with you for at least half of the year, which we're going to go through some of the other overnight uh, requirements, that kind of thing. And so this is what lawyers need to know is they need to know what the head of household filing status means to your client and consult with your client CPA. So, and probably it would be a good idea to, to have your client talk to their CPA before y'all go into mediation or something like that. So everybody knows, you know, what the issues are. If it's something that a return, return has already been prepared, then they could probably easily tell you, like if their 2018 return, they filed married finally jointly, and there's somebody that has basically the same income going forward, then that CPA should pretty much be able to tell you, I would think pretty easily what the effects would be, you know, for 2019, what would be the best way um, to handle that. And sometimes it takes, you know, it, it it might take if that 2018 return hasn't been prepared or you have somebody that, you know, has uh, income that fluctuates, then there's probably a calculation that's going to need to be done to, to, you know, the math needs to be done to figure out what the best results are going to be for the parties. And, um, you know, there's lots of CPAs that do this kind of work, and I would think, you know, even if you had somebody that that sometimes the clients don't feel comfortable going back to the CPA that's prepared the return, like maybe they are, um, you know, one party might think they're more one-sided for the other party since they've kind of had the correspondence with them over the years. But something like this could be, you know, I guess it depends on how complicated the the income is and that kind of thing. But it could be that it's an hour, you know, an hour consultation for a CPA to run the numbers for you. And that way you can, I guess, know that you're advising your client in the right manner. Okay, this next slide shows you um, two examples of the value of the head of household filing status. Um, and so you can see on the left-hand side that we've got a single person that makes $40,000. and so you're going to see two columns, the single and the house and the head of household. So if he's making $40,000 and for a single person, the standard deduction is $12,000. So his taxable income is $28,000. And the federal tax calculated on that $28,000 of income is $3,169. So if you take that same person who's making $40,000 and now they're the one that's eligible for the head of household, their standard deduction is increased to $18,000. So their taxable income has been reduced to $22,000 and that's a, so their tax due on that $22,000 is $2,368 which is a savings of $802 for somebody that's making $40,000. And in the next scenario, it says, it shows you the, what somebody that's making $75,000 and how that uh, benefits filing head of household versus single. And so you have somebody that makes 75,000, if they're single, they're gonna 
take the standard deduction of $12,000 based on the new rate, and so their taxable income is going to be $63,000, which is going to give them a tax of $9,799. If you take that same person, you get give them the head of household status, they get to deduct $18,000 as their standard deduction, which can which is going to give them a $50,000 taxable income. And the federal tax on that $57,000 is $7,088. So somebody that's making $75,000, they just saved $2,712 by being able to file the head of household versus single. So um, a couple other benefits that some of them I've talked about, some of them I have not, about claiming the head of household is you get to claim the standard, I think I mentioned before that if one, if you're doing married filing separately, one, if one itemizes, the other itemizes. If one files the standard deduction, the other one files the standard deduction. And in this case of head of household, you get the standard deduction even if the other spouse itemizes. So. That's a good benefit, especially since your rates have the standard deduction has increased to eighteen thousand dollars for head of household. So um, that's a good increase. Then the standard deduction is higher than it is if you're single or married filing separately. So again, it's eighteen thousand dollars versus twelve thousand dollars if you're single or married filing separately. The tax rates are usually lower. Again, I said it's uh, kind of a case-by-case -case basis depending on what your income level is. And then lastly, you, it allows you to claim certain credits such as the dependent care credit and if you qualify for the earned income credit. But these are credits that you cannot claim if you file Mary filing separately. Okay, this slide says sharing is nice, but you can't share the child tax credit, but you can transfer. So you can't share it for one child, but there are ways for you, if you have two children and you meet the eligibility requirements, it could be that one of you claim one and one of you claim the other one. Um, but you can transfer. So. Right, so transferring the child tax credit, and this form is not new, the IRS form 8332, which is the release, revocation, release of the claim to exemption for child by custodial parent. And only the custodial parent can transfer the credit to the other parent. And um, if you look at the form, which I don't have the materials, but the form 8 332, there's three different sections of that form. And so section one is if you're going to release the exemption for the current year. And section two is if you're going to release it for future years. And then section three is if you want to rev revoke the release for future years. And again, this needs to be filled out by the custodial parent, but the non-custodial parent must attach it to their return. So. Right. Now, an interesting problem, we've had Form 8332 for many, many years. I have not heard of the IRS denying uh, use of the dependent exemption, okay? which is what it was used for prior to, or 2018 and prior. I have not heard of the IRS denying that based on the failure to provide with the return IRS form 8332 signed by the custodial parent. Now, that being said, please note, this is one of your traps you gotta worry about. 
the IRS could change their mind and start enforcing that requirement. The law is very, very clear. In order to take advantage of the child tax credit, if you ain't the custodial parent, you need Form 8332, which means two things. One, a lot of lawyers miss this, okay? Now, in Tennessee, we put the form and reference the form in the parenting plan form itself, and I imagine many other states as well. But what I would re recommend you do in, in another level is really take this as an opportunity for a value-added service to your clients, meaning if you have a standard operating procedure in terms of when you go to mediation, what do you take with you? Take form 8332, print it out. What's really cool about the form, all you have to do is to type in IRS form 8332 into Google and it pops up in a PDF. Print it out, take it with you or save it, whatever, and have that out at mediation and see if you can get the other side to sign in as part of the settlement package if you do it that day. And that's a very nice um, value-added service. It makes you look, whether you're detail-oriented or not, it'll make you look like you are. Or make sure that your staff, if you've got a very professional staff, make sure that they're on top of it. Uh, this is, again, not a terribly complicated form. And I would think uh, this would be a great opportunity for paralegals and legal assistants to get involved and make a difference and make a contribution in their clients' lives. Because as what Cindy talked about earlier, this is real money. A couple of grand a year over 14, 15 years, that adds up. And in, in many opportunities, you know, you paid for your own legal fees by helping them with this, with this service. Now, um, one of the things I would also, do we have IRS publication? Uh, yeah, yeah. Which one is that? That's the divorced or separated individuals. Which, 504. Yeah, 504. Another quick practice tip. When you're done with your divorce, print out the current version of publication 504. It's a great PDF. It's not that long. But, yeah, but it's it's awesome. And uh, double space it so you can save for the environment. But mail it to your clients. And tell them to look at it every year because it's going to change. And it's going to give you a nice summary of what the tax law is, applies to them, whether they got, whether they got kids or not. So um, I really, really like this as a value-added tool. And we try to make sure every client that we do a divorce for with our uh, end letter where we tell them we're closing the file and here's the things you need to do and here's the things we're going to do for you. Uh, include IRS Publication 504 and or 8332. I think as Miles said, if you have that in your package when you're going to mediation, it's going to trigger the discussion on who gets to claim the children and, um, I mean, all the issues that we're discussing today, probably just having that form is enough to kind of a, a reminder on how to address the issues. Okay, this one's an important one. What can be transferred? So only the child tax credit can be transferred. The dependent care credit and the head of household cannot be transferred. All right, this is a custodial parent, which may be different based on what state you're in, but this is the IRS guidelines. The custodial parent defined by the IRS is the parent who has lived, the parent the child has lived with and has the greater number of overnights. And so I get this question often is, well, what happens if you have equal overnights? Well, in my mind, I guess I'm not sure really how you have equal overnights. I mean, I've seen it where you have I mean, somebody called me in mediation the other day and said they have 182.5 and 182.5. Well, how can you have a half of an overnight? I mean, so technically, 
unless you're in a leap year, I guess, you would have somebody has one more overnight than the other one. But the IRS guidelines say if you have equal overnight, then the higher, the person with the higher adjusted gross income gets the benefit of claiming the child. Okay, so this is this is a lot of um, eligibility requirements for the child independent care tax credit, which is not quite as financially beneficial as the child tax credit. Penny, I'm going to just stop you there. Now, okay. as a family lawyer, I'm going to call you and ask you the following question. Okay. Yeah, we had equal, equal parenting time, 182.5, 182.5. And I understand exactly what you just said, that it, who gets to claim the child tax credit depends on who has the greater income, adjusted gross income, right? If they have equal overnight. Right. Well, that's what we're just, we're negotiating here in my case okay. that I'm calling you for advice on. How do I find out what the other person's adjusted gross income is if they're not if they're not willing to tell me? What should I do? Well, I mean, I would think you have income records to say what their income. You mean they're no, no, they're not future. providing oh their future. We're getting a divorce. Right. How do we determine who's going to get to use the child tax credit if I don't if the other spouse won't give me their a copy of their tax return. Maybe you put some kind of language in the agreement that if it's above a certain amount and they're going to be, I mean, I don't know how to do that if they're not going to give you the information. You know? Well, they're not going to agree to give you a copy of their tax return for the next 15 years. They might do it for a child support modification. And many, in Tennessee, there's a duty to exchange income information for child support purposes, but people don't do it. Right. So what am I going to do, Cindy? Well, I mean, do you really think that someone's going to have 182 and a half? How do you have 100? And, how do you have a half of an overnight? We do that all the time because it's equal, equal. The parent, the, the many, many of the fathers come in and say, I want equal time or come hell or high water. And then there's some states that mandate it. So, in other words, there's no answer to this question. But if you have an agreement, this is where the, I'm trying to uh, exaggerate to make a point here. This is another example of why having this seminar is important. You know that it's probably easier to get a parent to agree to who's going to have advantage of the uh, tax credit regardless of the income. Even when it's equal, equal time, you can still have an agreement as long as you have IRS Form 8332 filled out, okay? So in my experience, and I would imagine a vast majority of those in the listening audience, is that you alternate the use of the child tax credit regardless if you're going to split the baby, so to speak, in terms of 182.5. Now, if you agree to do that with the other spouse and alternate child tax credits, just keep in mind there are some phase outs that Cindy, you haven't talked about that. Yeah, I don't. Okay, she's already talked about that. But so that's why your phase outs are important to know that you're not agreeing for your client to take advantage of something that they can't use if they're making over, you know, over the amount of the, the maximum amount used and you want everybody to get as much free money and that's what I call 8332 the IRS form for claim form for free money it's a credit it's two thousand dollars it's a straight deduction you can you can get a refund uh, back because of it which is awesome so anyway this is a problem that the difference between IRS and real life so to speak uh, can't solve but you can do the best you can with the situation and make lemonade out of lemons by negotiating 8332 execution. Okay. All right, so this is a list of the eligibility requirements to claim the child independent care credit. So the dependent child must be 12 years old or younger at the time the child care is provided. 
spouses and this is this is more um I'm going to say this rule, but it's probably not one that you're going to really need a whole lot of. Spouses and other dependents don't have an age requirement, but IRS rules say that they must have been physically or mentally incapable of self-care and must have lived with you for more than half the year. If you're married, you must file a joint return. I think I mentioned that before. You cannot get the dependent care credit if you file married filing separately. You must have earned income. So the reason you're getting this dependent care credit is because you have a job, you're going to work. The in investment or dividend income does not count. You must provide the care provider's name, address, taxpayer identification number, either social security number or an employee identification number. You can't claim the credit for payments to care providers who are your spouse, number one a parent of the dependent child, a dependent on your tax return, and you can't claim a credit if you're paying a child who is 18 years or under or younger, regardless if they are listed as a dependent on your tax return. And these qualifying expenses can go beyond the physical care and extend to household services. There's a whole uh, write-up of more detail that I'll tell you about later. Um, so the dependent, the child and dependent care tax credit is anywhere from 20 to 35 percent of up to three thousand dollars of child care and similar costs for children under 13, a disabled spouse or parent or another dependent so that you can work and up to six thousand dollars of expenses for two or more dependents. So the next page, I'm going to show you kind of an example of how that's calculated. And I did not put the chart in here, but that percentage on the previous slide, I said that percentage ranges from 20 to 35 percent. That's based on your income. And if you look, one of the um, publications that we're going to talk about later is the Child Independent Care Expenses. That's publication 503. In there is your table that tells you the percentage that you get based on your income. So, so here we have as an example, because I know you all love math, uh, you have a working mom that pays $1,000 a month for daycare for her one-year-old child. Her salary is $50,000 a year, which entitles her to a 20% credit. I think the, just so y'all, I think the chart says that around $43,000 and up is at the 20%. So I think it's at, if you're making $15,000, that's when you're getting the 35% credit. So, so it's $3,000 is the max. So even though she's paying $12,000 a year for that child care, you can only use $3,000 of the expenses. And you take that times 20%, and so she gets a $600 credit, which is, again, the same as the child tax credit. It's a dollar-for-dollar dollar credit. So it's real money in her pocket. Now, there's also a – it's something called an ODC, which you would see in some of these publications, which means other dependent credit. So this is a $500 non-refundable credit for qualifying dependents who cannot be claimed for the child tax credit. So I think like a perfect example of this would be uh, if you have a college student that qualifies as your dependent, you can get the head of household, but they're over the age of um, 17, so you can't take the child tax credit. So you could get a $500 non-refundable credit for them. And this chart here is the, it's called the availability of the child tax credit. So this kind of just shows you a few different examples based on different adjusted gross income levels of who is eligible to claim the credit. So in the first example, you have mom making 25000 and dad making 250000 In that case, dad is over the income limitation, so the credit is only available to the mother. In 
The second situation, mom is making $100,000 and dad is making $175,000. In that situation, either parent is eligible for the child tax credit. And then in the last example, mom's making 200,000 and dad's making 500,000. And in that situation, the mom is the only one that's eligible for the credit. So that just gives you a few examples. All right, so this is uh, an alimony. I just thought we would talk about this because it's something that comes up. I mean, it doesn't come up as often this year because in, um, in December of last year, everybody was rushing to get their agreements done because of the change. So just so everybody's aware that this is out there, alimony payments are no longer deductible by the payer and no longer taxable to the recipient. And these are for divorce or separation instruments that were entered into after December 31st of 18. So anything going forward, is not going to be able to be deductible. Uh, one question that comes up a good bit is if you have a modification. And so you can modify an old agreement and the old tax law will still stay in effect unless you specifically say in the modification that it is based on the new tax law, which I'm really not sure why anybody would want to do that, but I guess, you know, that it is an option to do that, if that makes sense. This was another item that I thought related to family law lawyers and the children issue is a new law with the 529 plans is that you can now use them for elementary or secondary public private or religious school which it used to be just used for college in the past and that is limited to ten thousand dollars per tax year per beneficiary um, there's still no limit for the the college but for the elementary school and private school it's limited to ten thousand dollars but, you know, sometimes if you have grandparents or something that have funded these 529s and there's plenty of money in there, it's a great tool to be able to use to um, pay for the lower school education. And a lot of states have, I mean, Tennessee is not one of them, but a lot of states have where you can get a tax deduction for putting money into those 529 plans. So this is a great tool to pay for, you know, if you're paying for private school is if you're in one of those states that allows you to do that, that you get, you know, a deduction, you get to use it. I mean, it's $10,000 a year, but that's, you know, a good, nice deduction. All right. Um, this is the earned income credit, which I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, but I just wanted everybody to be aware, I guess, what the... Um, thresholds are. And so you can see on this chart, if you're filing single, head of household, or widowed, and you have zero children, you can get the um, earned income credit if you make $15,570 or less. And that credit, you see at the bottom, kind of gives you the different credits that are available. It's $529. And you can see as the chart goes up, and it depends on how many children you have, the income limitations, and the, you know, the maximum credit amount. And the um, investment income limitation that's included in those numbers is limited to $3,600, which is, you know, why it's called the earned income credit, because you have to have earned income. Child tax credit is the end near. Well, as the tax law says, this is these changes are supposed to go till 2025. And then at that point, we don't know what's going to happen. So um, I don't know, Miles, have you seen anybody addressing anything in agreements as far as what happened? You know, like if you have a one-year-old, they're – 
they're going to still be a child, you know, in 2025. No. No. Okay. All right, and here's an example, um, just kind of putting all these things together. So you have Sally Jones is a mother, and she is a lawyer, and she earns $200,000 a year annual salary. And then you have dad, Fred Jones. He is a school principal and earns $75,000 a year. They have three children who are ages two, five, and seven. And dad has primary custody with 225 overnights, and mom has 140 overnights per year. The two-year-old is still in daycare at $1,000 a month, and mom is paying. Mom is paying that. So this also it says father has primary custody, but he's also, according to the IRS, because he has the more overnights, he's also also considered the custodial parent. So who gets to claim the child tax credit? So the father, based on income levels and his um, that he has more overnight, he is eligible to claim all three children, which at $2,000 per child is $6,000 child tax credit, which is the maximum that you are allowed is $6,000, no matter how many children you have. So father can transfer, so they're in the middle of mediation. Father can transfer the child tax credit for one or more of the children to the mother using the form 8223. Oh, that's, that's a wrong print. I'm just sorry. I just realized that. <laughs> it, that's not the right. The form is 8332. Sorry. I somehow transposed the numbers there. Um, but however, so, so he can transfer that if he wants to. I'm not sure why he would, based on the fact that he's making seventy-five thousand and mom's making two hundred, um, unless you know it was some kind of something that was very relevant to her, and he was going to get something else. But I'm not sure why he would want to give up his six thousand dollars for somebody that's making seventy-five. But the other issue is that remember that the credit starts phasing out when you hit 200,000 for somebody that is single. So for mom, let's say, you know, she's an attorney and she starts making, next year she makes 300,000. She's not gonna be able to take the credit anyway. So, um, because it's reduced for every thousand dollars over 200,000 is reduced by $50. Okay, so who gets to claim the dependent care? Mother is paying $1,200 a month for the child care, and father is the custodial parent, but he is not paying for the work-related child care. And so the answer is that both parties lose because um, mom cannot deduct the dependent care credit if she's not the custodial parent. Now could, I mean, the solution to, sorry. The solution would be you could have dad pay for the custodial parent. I mean, sorry, you could have dad pay for the dependent care and somehow work that out through your negotiation, through your child support worksheets or whatever that, that dad pays for it and then everybody wins because it's, it's allowable. Okay, so this next slide is some of the additional sources that are available. And so I have IRS publication 972, which is the child tax credit. And as Miles mentioned, these are fairly easy to read. Um, the problem is sometimes finding 
exactly what you need because you'll see on this slide there's four different publications that I think are very relevant to this topic. One is the publication 972, the child tax credit. The other is publication 501, which talks about your qualifications for a dependent, what your standard deductions are, and what your filing requirements are. Publication 503 is child and dependent care expenses. And that's gonna give you all of the qualifications on what, what counts as a dependent care expense, who can be the provider, what the income limitations are, who can get it. Um, and then publication 504, which and again, Miles recommended that you give that to your clients. That's the divorced or separated individuals. That one is only 10 pages. And I mean, I, I think it's a great, I know it's not exciting for y'all, but I think it's a great read. And, um, you know, it summarizes some of these issues and then it will, in, in this publication, the 504, it will reference you back to some of these other publications. But those are the four main ones that I keep on hand to kind of, you know, if I need to refer back to something. And if you're going to go on, the next slide, I think, goes through... Um, this shows you where you can get these. So if you want to go on to that, I don't know if you can click on that link, if, if you can do that, but you can go on the IRS website and um, just type in the publication 504 and you can get it in PDF format. And I would really recommend doing that for all of them. The other benefit that it does is um, all of these publications have examples in it. So, you know, you might find a topic and it give you like, I know I was reading one of them and it gave that example about you have a child that, um, you know, turns 17 the last day of the year. Or um, it, it gives good examples throughout all of these publications that might help if, you know, if you can't find exactly what you're looking for, those examples might help you get the answer. Or you can call your CPA. They'll probably know the answer. All right, so in summary, um, the goal here is to keep the financial resources in the family. And so you need to determine who is eligible for the head of household, who is eligible for the child tax credit, and who is eligible for the dependent care credit. Those are the three main issues when you have children. And then the question you need to ask, and probably, again, before you get to mediation, is do I need to consult with the CPA to run some scenarios and options, you know, based on historical income and income going forward. I guess it depends a lot on how complicated the income is. If you if you have a you know, a sole proprietor that their income goes all over the place and um then you might, you know, want to have them run different projections and that might give you some language that you can put <clears throat> put into the agreement. Can I some advice? Sure. All right. A couple of quick tactical pieces of advice. Now, for this immediate discussion, we're going to assume that father makes more than mother. They're going to be a divorce just for this. So if you represent mother, most of the time you're just going to want to leave this alone because the mother's going to have the child tax credit, assuming she has greater than 50-50 time. Okay. Now, one of your options in your settlement, if you represent father in that situation, is to negotiate and write up where he gets access to all existing and future tax law opportunities for credits and deductions associated with the children, okay? Make sure that it applies to current and future tax law and that mother agrees to execute IRS Form 8332 
and any other forms uh, required by the IRS for a father to take advantage of those opportunities. Now, as a sub-issue there, one of the things you can do is, re is um, require the father to buy those credits. So to the extent he takes advantage and gets a $2,000 credit, he would then owe the mother following the, or at the time of the issuance of his tax return, one half of the credit that he received, either for the child tax credit or, um, I don't know that she, he's gonna be able to get dependent care credit, but to the extent he does get dependent care credit, he could have to pay mother one half, okay? Now, also from a planning standpoint, if your state allows for work-related child care deductions and the parents are open to who is primarily responsible for payment of those work-related child care, which in most of my cases that's not negotiated because one parent's generally more uh, assertive in that area anyway. The um, there is an opportunity there for that tax uh, opportunity in terms of the father if the father pays and the father is available to get the uh, dependent care credit that way that that your client can get a twofer because you're going to get a an adjustment on the child support guidelines as well as the tax credit. But again, keep in mind you may want to have a kickback from one parent to the other, contractually um, uh, included within your uh, parenting plan or divorce settlement. <clears throat> um, the one other thing I wanted to mention was, <coughs> sorry, that, um, you know, because this is the first year that, that these new tax laws are in effect, there's really not a whole lot of guidelines and regulations that are out there that I think once people have filed, you know, the IRS is typically a little slow on some things. And so I'm not sure that we are going to see a lot of regulations come out until probably, I would say probably 2020 when, you know, all of the 18 returns get processed through the end of the year. I think we're going to see some more regulations out there if, as far as if there's any, you know, tax cases and things out there, that's probably not going to be, you know, who knows when that will be. But I think there will be some more guidelines and regulations that are coming out. It's just a matter of, you know, we have to get through everybody filing their 18 return and, and um, figuring out what the issues were going forward. Um, so I think we're going to ask some, we're going to answer some questions. Yes, I think we have a few. I am technically challenged here. If parent A does not have the majority of overnights, can parent A ever claim head of household? You cannot transfer the, the head of household, so that would be no. All right, so if you do represent parent A, um, no, strike that if you represent parent B, you definitely wanna leave all that alone and be quiet about deductions, credits, and and filing. So head of household is not really on your radar screen for the negotiations except for parenting night. So you definitely want to try to get a majority of parenting nights. And that's that's really kind of their own I don't want to say only, but a big consideration when you're talking about do you want your client to have equal equal time or do you want your client to have slightly more than equal time so that they can claim the head of household. So I would definitely um, include that in my toolkit 
for when you're having those discussions that the net difference could be six, what, six, eight thousand dollars a year easily. Mm -hmm. uh, difference in a half day of parenting. <clears throat> Um, next question is, is it true that the parent claiming the dependency exemption gets all of the credits automatically? I mean, if they meet the eligibility, all the eligibility requirements, and they have more, um, you know, they're claiming the dependence exemption, then yes. Not that, but they can still transfer the credit, but, but it's, according to the IRS, it's going to be theirs to claim the credits. All right, the next question, somebody asked where the 10-page publication for 504, I only see a 30-page one online. Um, I've printed off, you might have to go and look. This one is dated. Oh. It is 30 pages. I was wondering which. Okay, well then, I'm not sure what I printed out because I only have 10 pages, so. Yeah, it's a 30 okay, page. Maybe it, is a th I'm sorry. it is. That was so like, Okay. It I is remember. A 30. <laughs> so, if you want to save trees, go ahead and email the link to your clients. But um, I like to have something to hand them. And you yeah. may want to send them IRS. I mean, there's nothing wrong with sending it to them or including it in your initial client packet. I mean, I don't want to hand that to my client in the initial packet because they're usually pretty freaked out. You know, in the first couple of weeks of filing, you don't want to hand them a bunch of tax law. So. Um, but all I'm going to say about this publications is make sure you, you if you get them online, you get the most recent one. Because you might find some of these publications that were available prior, like this one that I'm looking at, Publication 504, at the bottom left-hand corner was dated February 5th of 2019. So that's when this came out. And it says for use and preparing 2018 returns. So a lot of times, as the new year comes about, the IRS makes adjustments and that kind of thing. So you just want to make sure that you're using the most updated one. Yeah, and as a practice tip, what we're doing in our divorce settlements with respect to taxes and the parenting plan is what I recommend people do and what I do is address the current return one way or the other. So if the parties have already filed a uh, joint return for 2018 because they were still married as of 12-31-2018, okay? I want to state that in the agreement. And if they've already filed their term, what are we doing with the refund and or the liability associated therewith? We gotta, we gotta, who's going to pay it? Who's going to get the refund? Now, if they haven't filed, what I want to do, and you know, talk to your CPA, take your CPA out to lunch and have them tell you, you know, how many people are actually completing their returns by April 15th anymore and how many are doing October 15th. So even though you're doing working on a divorce in 2019, the tax return for 2018 may not even be done. So you may want to go ahead and negotiate how it's going to be done. What are the people going to file because they do have the option of married filing jointly or married filing, filing separately for settling in 2019, and they were married on 1231. They were still married as of 1231-2018. So my advice is no matter where they are in the process relating to their return, even if it's as simple as, well, the parties filed a joint return, the parties received the refund and have already divided it, that's good to have in your agreement so that you, A, you know that box is checked. Okay, your client reads it. Yeah, that's what happened. You know, we don't have to deal with filing status. And it's just a box that's checked as opposed to a box that's unchecked and where the divorce settlement fails to discuss the most recent tax return. Yeah, I know that's a little bit, it could be considered overkill for many people, but, you know, 
the the worst thing that happens is that we're stating something that was already agreed upon and already done in the past and really doesn't impact the future. On the other hand, if we have that discipline, we know we're going to deal with what needs to be dealt with um, moving forward in terms of filing status and refund and tax liability. I mean, when I mentioned before about, you know, one of the things y'all might want to consider is, is it, is it worth consulting with a CPA to have them run different scenarios? But that could be for this issue of the children, but it could also be for, you know, if you're going to, if their support is an issue and you're trying to figure out how much somebody has net after tax to pay the other spouse and you don't have, Maybe they have, especially this year, when you don't have two thousand. If you don't have two thousand and eighteen returns completed yet, you're basing it on seventeen numbers. And unless you have somebody go and calculate, you know, what the eighteen tax is, you really don't know what the true um, net after tax is in order to figure out what the support is. Right. And here's my favorite from the CPAs um, telling me no. So I call them up and I say, well, I want to know what the projected tax return looks like for my client based on current tax law. Well, what are they going to say? Well, my update hasn't arrived for the current tax year. Well, here's what you tell them. Run it on the prior year. Even if it's not perfect analysis, it's going to be close enough, especially since we had this major change and the major change is already in the computer software update. So the net, you can't know everything, but if you do have the prior return loaded up into the computer and making a few adjustments here and there, will take seconds. And if the CPA gives you a bunch of pushback on it, um, you're not communicating well because what, what you're asking them to actually do is not complicated. You're asking them to project and advise based on last year's taxable information with some a few points of data that are changed and like i said either you can yell at them which is what i do you know and, call, and verbally abuse them okay i mean they're not verbally abused, but it, most of the time they they overthink the situation when we just need some basic simple planning in terms of what should we be looking at it, do, does dad want to be financially liable for child care or does mom want to be liable for child care we need to spell that out, and if we can get – the other thing is I don't recommend taking on financial obligations just so that you can take advantage of the tax credit, but except for child tax credit. I mean, you definitely want to try to negotiate that at a minimum alternating. But also, here's a little practice tip. Check with respect to the guidelines in your state and see if there's an assumption that the uh, custodial parent receives the uh, benefit under the guidelines of tax credit and or exemptions. Now, the guidelines may not say that, but the point is, if there is an assumption and you got the other side giving you a hard time about wanting that credit, then you point to the guidelines and say, well, your child support's already been um, reduced because I'm, the guidelines assume my client, the mother, the custodial parent, is going to receive the tax benefits. So it's already lower than what it needs to be because it's already factored in. So just keep that in mind. Um, but at the same time, I'm a big believer. I, I'm a, I want the IRS to get as little of my client's money as possible. And, uh, you know, on a personal level, i I while I like to contribute to charities, I don't consider the U.S. government one of them. Um, there's one more question that I think we have time for that I think is a good one that I did not address, is both parents can claim the head of household after the divorce. Is that correct? And if the parties agree that dad will claim one child tax credit and mom will claim one child tax credit, they have two kids, both can claim the head of household. I guess the answer is they can if they meet all the eligibility requirements. So, you know, the, in the perfect situation, maybe 
dad has the son that lives with him and mom has the daughter that lives with her most of the time. And I'm, I'm just picking a scenario, but it is possible if you meet all the eligibility requirements. Hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. And uh, I think that's all that we have time for. All right. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the ABA oh. section of Family Law, thank you for participating in the program. To learn more about the sponsors, visit the ABA website at www.americanbar.org. Thank you, and please now click on the evaluation link. Uh, we, we value your feedback.